There we are. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hey, you're muted. You're on mute. There we go. Say so thank goodness for multiple types of technology, right? Wonderful. Terrific. Then everything that sends smoke signals. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> well, great. Well, um, geez, it's 10.03. We've got 36 folks on the line. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, for Thank you for joining us for another installment of Empowering Rural Arizona. We're fortunate today to have Cindy Patak with us from uh, the Economic Development Administration. Cindy is Arizona's representative for the EDA. Uh, and she's uh, really been wonderful to work with in her, geez, I think you've been here a year now. Um, yeah, just a little over a year. Yeah, so uh, it's really great, and the timing was perfect uh, in, uh, for Cindy to get her feet on the ground here in Arizona before uh, the, uh, the American Rescue Plan money came out. And so since that money has come out, the topic of the EDA grants has been uh, a very popular one. And we thought it would be timely to have Cindy uh, come back and join us and tell us a little bit more about what some of those grants intentions are and um, uh, what some of the guidelines may be for, um, for those, uh, those areas. So uh, without further delay, because I hate the word ado. Uh, we'll <laughs> Cindy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I know Armando's on the line. Are you guys going to bring up the presentation? Sure. Uh, Thank you. Share the screen, and it would be that one. Sure. And I'm not going to do it right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because, again, as I mentioned to Keith, uh, once I start talking, I kind of lose my ability to multitask. So I, I can't thank you enough for doing that. <clears throat> but again, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I am so happy to be here. As Keith mentioned, I've been here a little bit over a year in Arizona. Um, I've been, uh, I came here specifically to work with the Economic Development Administration to recover, help, help with their recovery efforts under the CARES Act. And now we're moving into ARPA, so, or the American Rescue Plan. So we've got a, a, a lot of great information to share with you. I've given this presentation a few times, uh, and I don't know if anyone has uh, taken the opportunity to look at some of the webinars that our Deputy Assistant Secretary and our executive leadership have given over the past few weeks. Um, I think if you take away anything from those webinars, if you've seen them one time, the word that I keep hearing over and over from our team is transformational. Uh, and that's what we're looking to do here. And I think probably it'll, it, it, it's absolutely gonna take that as we move through a pandemic environment into post recovery and build in resiliency for our, our, our economies as we move forward. So there's a lot of new information here. It's a new, it's kind of a new way of doing business for us. So we're, we're learning too, and, and along with you. So I just wanna share with you before we begin that no great idea is off the table. If it's something that we haven't seen before, um, we're gonna work very closely with you to see how we could make, how we could work together uh, to transform communities in Arizona. Next slide. There we go. Thank you. So before we get before we get into the meat of the matter, I just really want to revisit EDA's mission. And you know, we're a very small agency, and uh, there there could be some folks that are unfamiliar with us still. Uh, and I know that there are a lot of folks that I've been talking to that really haven't applied for grants, federal grants at all, or could be first time grantees, potential grantees with the Economic Development Administration. So first and foremost, when we talk about our mission, we really are the lead federal economic development agency in, in the United States. Again, very small. We've, we've really kind of ramped up significantly since the pandemic. Uh, and our goal really is to uh, increase America's global economic competitiveness. And so goes America and hopefully goes Arizona. And, and you know, we do that by supporting community-led economic development. So it's really grassroots efforts that we're looking to support. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, top down in that regard. Um, we launched our investment priorities. We've updated our investment priorities. You can, you can move that along, Keith. 
<laughs> Thank you. So yeah, and so along with our mission, um, EDA has a series of investment priorities and we update that from time to time. The last time we did that was just this past April, as a matter of fact, in anticipation of these funding opportunities. And I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on these. Uh, I have the link here to, and we can go on our website to kind of take a look at them in depth. But I really wanna say here and share with you is that equity is really at the forefront for us, as well as recovery and resilience. Uh, as we move forward into recovery, we understand that uh, in order uh, to build strong economies, we really do have to build a resilient economy. And the way we do that is by including everyone uh, and particularly populations that have been marginalized in the past. Our other focus is workforce development, manufacturing, technology-based economic development and uh, environmentally sustainable economic development as well as exports and foreign direct investments. Uh, again, the equity investment priorities is extremely important as we move through all six. Cindy, yes. Uh, um, equity. It, what does that mean? Are we talking about um, getting disadvantaged communities uh, on par with communities that have uh, means? Are we talking about people? Or are we talking about projects? What's the the spirit behind that? The spirit behind that. And I think it is, it's, it is about people. If you look at our equity investment priority, if you look it up on the website, we specifically mentioned populations, women, people of color, uh, marginalized communities. So they could be people and they are communities. And I think when we talk to equity, I think we, we know equity is, is not necessarily the same as equal. So it doesn't mean that we leave anybody out. And so we're not talking about not focusing on we're not, we're not talking about focusing exclusively on populations, but we understand that in some cases, we're gonna to have to spend more time and effort to build uh, certain populations up. And so we have to have, and we have to place additional emphasis on that. We will, but we wanna bring everybody along. That to some extent, that's always been EDA's mission. Um, as, you, as you know, when we look at uh, even how to apply in terms of what the grant rate is, whether, what, the, what the matching requirement is, it's always really been about working in America's distressed communities. And in the past, we've looked at that either by census tracts, we've looked at unemployment numbers, we've looked at poverty levels. And I think when we speak to equity, we're, we're also saying that we understand that, that when we look at those numbers, they tend to disproportionately include women, people of color, and, and other marginalized communities. So I think there's a certain intersectionality there and a certain recognition that those populations uh, tend, tend to be um, specific. And, and we just want to, we just kind of want to address that moving forward. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so there are six, so what I wanna to talk to you about today specifically are the six notice of funding opportunities that we just published in July. I'd like to go over them in some detail. At the same time, I'd like to keep it conversational. I, I think that I'm hopefully I've interacted with a lot of folks on the line and surely I've worked closely with the Arizona Commerce Authority over the past year. I think Keith is gonna be monitoring the chat or Armando. So while we do have a, a Q and A period scheduled for the end, um, to the extent that folks want to contribute in the chat and we want to talk some things through as we go through everything, I'd really like to do that uh, because each and every one of these NOFOs is pretty specific in, in terms of what we're looking for. Um, and so I think it's a good opportunity to just kind of talk it through while, while we're presenting it, if that works for folks. Next slide. So... $3 billion it's, is what's coming in under the America Rescue Plan. Uh, we call that ARPA. Uh, I know that we speak in acronyms in the federal government. So if you hear me say ARPA or NOFO, ARPA is the American Rescue Plan. NOFO is Notice of Funding Opportunity. $3 billion is a historic investment for the Economic Development Administration. And again, we're focusing on bottom up economic development, focusing on advancing equity, which we talked a little bit about, creating good paying jobs, sustainable wages, uh, helping workers to develop in-demand skills, building economic resilience, and accelerating the economic recovery for industries and communities 
that were hit hardest by the pandemic. And, and we can talk about that specifically in Arizona as we move further. Um, and, and what that really means is the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to build the American economy, to build back better and also stronger, and which is why resiliency is something that you'll see threaded throughout each one of the funding opportunities. Next slide. So this is what our traditional uh, program portfolio looks like. So if you've worked with the EDA in the past, I think you'll be familiar with a lot of these. What I wanna draw your attention to is to uh, the graphic on the top left of the screen. And so that you know that when we, when we talk about the American Rescue Plan Act, the funding that comes from that is, is, is really a supplement to our annual appropriations. And you'll find that under the Economic and Adjustment Assistance. So under the CARES Act, for example, what that really was, was a supplement to our annual public works appropriation. And our, and our public works appropriation fits on, all under, under these other buckets, public works, planning, technical assistance, research and evaluation, trade adjustment assistance for firms, always about innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, we also have a revolving loan fund program. Cindy, um, question has come up several times and maybe you're gonna cover it later on, but communities affected by coal is yeah. that a subset of these various programs or is that a standalone program? Yeah, and I will talk about that in a, in a little bit more detail as we move further, but the short answer is it is not a standalone program. Uh, there's, there's $300 million that we've set aside under two of these funding opportunities, sp specifically for coal communities. So you'll find that embedded within uh, two of the six NOFOs. And I'll talk about those in detail as we go through each okay. one of the six. Great. Sure. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about eligible entities for EDA funding. And I think first and foremost, what I, I want to point out that we don't fund private individuals or for-profit businesses. And particularly with the commerce folks, you know, that's important because I know that you guys deal with a lot of private industry. And whether you're private or non-for-profit, everything we're doing right now seems to be a Herculean task with large dollars uh, it, um, associated with them. Um, and we've tried it a couple of different times. And, you know, we try, kind of try to talk it through. And as it turns out, really under no circumstances, and this includes also as a subrecipient um, or as a pass-through, we're, we're just not going to provide funds to for-profit ent entities or individuals. That said, um, who we do fund are our district organizations or economic development districts. And I think hopefully most of you folks have engaged with the districts. We have four of them, which does not, they do not cover the entire state of Arizona. So that's also important to know. But the four that we do have are NACOG, the National Arizona, um, Northern Arizona Council of Governments. We have SIGO, which is the Southeastern Arizona Government Organization. We have the CAG, Central Arizona Governments, and we have WIAD, uh, Western Arizona Economic Development District. So again, a bunch of acronyms, um, and they all produce what we also refer to as an, a SEDS, a Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. And so if you fall within their jurisdiction, it's my hope that if you haven't been working with them, that you will connect with them and really take a look at those documents um, and hopefully you've participated as a stakeholder in the um, formation of them. And, uh, but also if, if you're not, um, for some reason, we also accept SEDS equivalent. I, uh, I think the important thing is that when we look at your project, what we're, what we're really looking for is that your project is kind of plugged into some overarching strategy for which, you know, a lot of work has gone into it uh, to determine a need and also be uh, the, the potential for success. So that we know that if, if this, once this project is, is, is implemented, that it's going to be successful because you've already kind of done the research um, with a larger group or entity or community that recognizes the need and has the capacity to, to implement that. We also work with federally recognized Indian tribes. In Arizona, there are 22. Um, we also work with, and, and we work with governments, state and local governments, political subdivisions, local communities, towns, cities, uh, counties, state entities, 
institutions of higher education, the universities in Arizona are amazing and we work with a lot of them. And we also work with nonprofit organizations. Um, and the one caveat with that is that they must be working in, in cooperation with one of those political entities, which means that they're either being supported by that, um, by that entity through a letter of support or you're collaborating or you're in partnership with a political subdivision of the state. And those are the ones that I just mentioned, city, town, county, or state. Cindy, the question of private enterprise item, where does that end? In other words, um, if, if somebody was to get a construction grant, at some point they're going to have to hire subject matter experts uh, to do uh, something, excavation, yes. grading, uh, erecting the structure. Obviously, the money has to go to pay that contractor. Is that okay? Yes, and and that it and yes, and that's when we talk about project delivery. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're dealing with obviously government entities who aren't in the business of, of doing construction, and some are. Uh, I want to be fair, but yeah, what we're saying is the applicant is say I don't know. Let's say it's the state of Arizona, and you and you want to build something. Yes, it stands to reason that the reason that you come to work every day is not to build stuff. But what we would expect that, you know, you're going to issue the RFP, for example, you are going to manage the, the grant funds, you are going to manage the project. And in order to deliver that project, when you put out a request for proposals, proposal, you're going to hire someone that's skilled uh, to actually construct that project. And we would depend on you to do the stewardship and oversight including you know, the management of that contractor. And it could be multiple contractors, multiple skill sets. So you could be looking at several. It could be one large contractor that, that gets a bunch of subs. Um, there, there's many different ways it could work, but at the end of the day, we would also be requiring uh, a competitive bid uh, such that you know, we're, we're getting the, the most competitive and the best price and, and the best person or best company to do the job. Standard procurement. Yes, exactly. And yeah, and the Federal Code of Regulations does acknowledge state procurement regulations. So as long as you're following the state of Arizona or federal procurement guidelines, that's what we would look to. Um, if we have any other questions, we can take those or we could move forward to the next one. Okay. There we go. Is that it? Yes. So again, the, the three billion dollars really does break down into, and you can see these three buckets on the screen, and and, and you can see that this is really the way EDA is thinking about uh, building back an economy right now. Jobs for today, uh, communities built for everyone, and then regions for the future. And underneath those three buckets, what you see here are are those six notice of funding opportunities. And so, you know, we get a lot of questions as, you know, uh, for example, like which is which, which is the right NOFO? And while there's really no really right or wrong answer there, they do have their own individual tone and they're kind of all looking to achieve different things. And that's why there are six separate opportunities. The two that we have here in red are our biggest challenges by far. We feel that they're the most transformational. They really represent a new way for EDA and they are national challenges. And what I mean by that is for uh, several of the, of the notice of funding opportunities, the Seattle Regional Office will get a, an allocation or part of that total funding available, but the Good Jobs Challenge and the Big Be uh, Build Back Better Regional Challenge are, are uh, both programs that come out of head, uh, headquarters and those two are national competitions. Next slide. And so here's what it looks like on the screen. Here are the six funding opportunities that are available. And I will go over each and every one of these. And what you see to the right of, of the title of each one of them is the, the amount of money that has been set aside nationally. So I did mention the Good Jobs Challenge and the Big Be Build Back Better Regional Challenge and also the Statewide Planning and Research Challenge. The, those are all national challenges and those funds uh, come from headquarters. 
Uh, number one, the travel and tourism and outdoor recreation, NOFO, with $750 million. Part of that is a state grant or non-competitive grant, and part of that is a competitive grant. So to the right of that, what you'll see is state grants set aside at $510 million. And so each state by now has gotten a letter of invitation for a particular award, and there's large discretion to, for each state to implement that how they choose. And again, uh, these, are national, these are national numbers. Yes, yes. So and Arizona yes. got a, a portion of the 510. So, yes, so the, st the state, Arizona Office of Tourism did get an allocation from that $5 .5, million. Um, and so what remains out of the $240 million is, is through a competition, the Seattle Regional Office has got about $57.7 million. And the total allocations to each region are identified in that, in that, in, in each one of the notice of funding opportunities, somewhere along the lines of page 10 or something like that. You'll see the entire breakdown across the country. The economic adjustment and assistance NOFO out of the $500 million, the Seattle Regional Office has gotten 59.4 million. And then the other one that has come to the Seattle Regional Office is the Indigenous Communities NOFO. So out of that $100 million, 43.8 million has been set aside in Seattle for Indigenous communities. And Cindy, I, I would imagine each, each NOFO explains what a per, per award limit is. So, what we do have, there isn't any statutory limits, uh, but we do have uh, kind of like I would say a sweet spot in terms of what we're looking at. I think that's about between three and $5 million. Okay. That's not to say that we won't make awards that are less than that for, for perhaps smaller projects. And we could go uh, over that, but I think what you'll see is the intent of the administration really is to really fund as many projects as we possibly can. Um, without any particular rule of thumb, but again, that three to five million is is probably our sweet spot in which we can identify um, that we can really make an impact nationally. Makes sense. Next slide. <clears throat> so the reason I've highlighted these two in blue, the Economic Adjustment Assistance NOFO and the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, is because this is where we can start to have our conversation about coal communities. <clears throat> so again, not a separate program by any means, but it's through these two notice of funding opportunities that we see in the economic adjustment assistance NOFO, we have set aside $200 million and the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, we've set aside $100 million. Now that is a national set aside. We don't have any specific number for the Seattle Regional Office, but I think we do know that the concentration of coal communities tend to be in Arizona and Washington State for Seattle. And as we move forward in the conversation, we spend a little bit of time talking about what is a coal community because we, we don't have any predefined predefinition for that. But I'd like to talk talk everyone through it because I think there's a lot more latitude and a lot more opportunity there than, than we may think. Next slide. So again, bringing it back to coal communities out of that total $3 billion, we have 300 million set aside specifically for coal communities across the United States to ensure support for coal communities <clears throat> as they recover from the pandemic and create new jobs and opportunities. <clears throat> and I think that this is another area where we recognize that these areas of the United States have really suffered disproportionately because they're all already suffering before the pandemic hit and then just kind of hit harder. Um, and as I mentioned, 25% of that $3 billion has also statutorily uh, required to be set aside for the tourism industry. And the way that we are um, uh, doing that is the $510 million in non-competitive grants to the states, $240 million for competitive grants nationally. And I think we all know that by now that Arizona has really been hard hit, as has the rest of the world, with regard to a, a tourism economy, and we really want to build that up. Well, we've got to have a question from Julia from NACOG. Have any competitive funds been distributed in the Seattle region yet? Uh, not under the American Rescue Plan, no. Okay. Not yet. Um, you know, our first investment review committee, I mean, 
our first investment review committee where I think we're dealing with ARPA funds is, is going to be next week. Um, so we're going to we're going to start looking at those projects. I also wanted to just let you know that I have been working very closely with the Arizona Office of Tourism. And in particular, I think the tourism NOFO is a little bit complex because you've got that balance of competitive versus non-competitive states kind of taking the lead. But then there's some discretion for individual projects. So I've been working with them and we're going to discuss both of those um, sometime in September. And I feel that that will be um, marketed through the Arizona Office of Tourism. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but in the meantime, if you have any questions with regard to the competitive portion of the tourism NOFO, um, and, I'm, and I have been having conversations with folks, please feel free to reach out. Next slide. No, no. Thank you. Yes, I think it's important, particularly for rural Arizona, that we do have this conversation about what, what are coal communities and what exactly could the impact be here? And so first and foremost, what I really want to highlight, and I, and, I'm with, and I mean it sincerely, there is no predefined list of impacted coal communities that the EDA has and that we're thinking as big as we possibly can. So it, it's clearly the communities that live within, say, commuting distance of a coal-fired plant or coal mining, um, coal mining um, and related transportation. It also includes like the entire supply chain. So we've talked with communities, and it doesn't necessarily just mean Appalachia when we're talking nationally, because I know that's pretty much where, where people go right off the bat. And so we know it means Arizona. And we're talking about the entire supply chain. You know, so in talking with some of my colleagues and some of the other coal impacted states, we're talking about, you know, are there communities that manufactured supplies or dealt with logistics? Uh, or related transportation that dealt with the coal with the coal industry. And sometimes those are not so nearby. So if, if you can identify that, and if you can demonstrate that in your application um, and have the data to support that, and as you see on the bottom of the screen, you know, that appropriate third party economic and demographic statistics that really do show the impact of that coal plant closure or just the shutting down of the industry generally, to the extent that, that you have seen contractions in your economy, then you would fit under the definition of a coal impacted community and you would, you would have a strong application and you would be competing. Um, I, I feel whether you're in the Build Back Better or the EAA, you would kind of be in a subset of a coal community within those two NOFOs and you know, strategically positioned for those funds. So I don't know if we want to talk through those at all, but I, the next slide also kind of deals with this in a little bit more detail. Um, that we really do want to encourage coal communities to apply under these NOFOs. Um, they provide planning, assist, planning and technical assistance grants to help support states in their effort to develop, to develop plans and to revitalize coal communities. And you know that I maybe that's where we are right now. Um, where do we, how do we move forward uh, with impending coal plant closures or as we move into renewables and away from coal, for example, how do we make that transition? Um, the planning portion of that is, is critical. We, as again, as we mentioned, whether it's a SEDS or whether it's other type of strategic document moving forward, uh, coal communities needs are very specific. Uh, so the planning for that uh, is, needs to be very strategic and specific as well. And we will fund that. We will, we will fund the technical assistance piece of that um, because we're really looking to develop national communities of practice to support those coal communities in um, building those resilient economies. So if, um, if I am hearing you correctly, you know, we, we've had one coal fire power plant closed down in Arizona uh, to date. And that was in page. However, the the impact of that uh, plant spreads far and wide across the whole I forty corridor. Um, so there's no real geographic uh, definition to a community impacted by coal. Rather, it's the supply chain ripple effects. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and, and that can be quantified, you know, th you know, through data, which you're saying, you are really seeing a, a decline in your economy as a result. And that's because it is rippling through into your community because those pieces of that supply chain in your community are slowly shutting down. I see. Now we've got um, several coal fired power plants in Northeastern Arizona that haven't shut down yet, but are slated to. Um, I suspect that if somebody was going to apply from that region, they'd have to demonstrate how maybe the ramp down has already affected them. Mm -hmm as opposed to what may affect them in the future. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And what the way we would look at that is within the last two years or within the next four. Okay, good to know. That, that's yeah. key, yeah. And, and I also feel too, I know that that was the definition under the CARES Act and I, and I, don't, I don't know that that has changed. On the other hand, if you're already seeing, if a coal plant has already identified its closure and say, I don't know, say we're beyond that four year period. The other piece of that is, are you absolutely seeing a downturn in your economy? So, so maybe it is eight years down the road. Are they doing things now uh, to transition away and, and move toward closure that is impacting your community now? And if that's the case, I think that, that that's worth a conversation. And you know, and, and if I don't know the answer to that, I just tend to run it up the flagpole, speak to my colleagues, to, to get a to get an answer for you there, but, but again, think, the key there is to start to show a slowdown. Yeah, to me the the smell test is can you demonstrate? Absolutely, yeah, that is key. That's the important part. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are we ready to go to the next? Yeah, if there are no questions up coming up so uh, far. No. Yeah, okay. All right, so, so moving into the individual NOFOs themselves, the first one I'm going to go over today is the statewide planning research and networks. This is one of our national challenges at 90 million. Again, all the money is, is coming from headquarters. Seattle Regional Office is, is getting no distribution for that. And so through this notice of funding opportunity, EDA is really planning for a resilient future. So you may hear me say that a hundred more times um, but that's the, this is the point of the exercise, right? We've been through a lot over the past couple of years. So we are focusing on resiliency. And the way we're doing that is by supporting your efforts, the state's efforts and the community's efforts to really help local economies plan but, and also react to future economic disruptions. And by extending our reach, and we talked about this earlier, to historically underserved populations and communities to ensure that we build back better. Uh, 59 million of that represents, you know, and this is much like the tourism grant, right? Uh, for the planning grant, we also gave a million dollars to every state and territory to support state planning efforts. So the state of Arizona also received that million dollars and it is at the governor's discretion um, on how to use that, and I'm not, and I'm not sure to what extent the governor has made decisions on, on how how they're going to be doing that, and I would defer to Keith for that. Um, but the 31 million dollars that remains is for communities of practice and research grants. And if we move to the next slide, uh, we get into just a little bit more detail on that. So, you know, we we invest in economic plans, research to assess the effectiveness of EDA's programs. And we support stakeholder communities around key EDA initiatives. This is available to folks who have gotten grants from us in the past, and it's also open to new grantees as well. University systems, you know, really tend to receive a lot of funds from this uh, from this pot of money. Um, you know, also, for example, economic development districts, I think we've seen, you know, not only do economic development districts work, work on SEDS, but they also kind of have been doing a deeper dive into key areas of the economy that they know, like broadband, for example, or tourism, for example. So, you know, they really are kind of the backbone for us in, in the state of Arizona. And, but that said, everyone has the opportunity. We talked about coal communities. You know, if you're not ready to deliver projects, if you're really not sure what's next, um, if, for example, you know, you're, we're, look, we're talking regional clusters now, but we don't know what that looks like. As Keith mentioned, we know that, cult, that communities have suffered, but 
what is the ripple effect and how do we move forward? You know, maybe the way to do that is to just, you know, to, to do the planning and to kind of do the work and the research that could uncover what those next steps could look like. And this would be, um, this would be an excellent tool to do that. Next slide. Yeah, so yeah, and so yeah, example projects, for example, identifying trends, emerging issues, that's all good information for you. And it's, it's also great information for us too, because a lot of what we learn from these projects, you know, actually kind of manifest themselves in, to how the EDA continues to evolve as well and how we can continue to support you. And I think you'll see that um, just from the transformational nature of what we're doing right now. Asking um, what economic injury includes uh, gives an example about, um, I believe, their um, housing decline, the uh, loss of affordable housing um, due to the influx of, of new residents uh, to Arizona. Um, so does, does economic injury uh, translate down to the affordable housing uh, component of an economy? Well, when we, when we talk about economic development, um, EDA doesn't typically get into the housing, housing development portion of it. But again, without knowing specifics, if that's an element, like for example, in the comprehensive economic development strategies that the EDDs do, uh, they do a plan for a five year period and they do yearly updates. That issue is frequently addressed. So in the planning realm, absolutely, whatever economic distress looks like in your community, it, uh, when we talk about planning and research, yeah, it's important to bring all of that in. I think that when we start to look at how you implement uh, you know, strategies or tactics out of your plan, it's important to look at those solutions in, you know, through the lens of perhaps a variety of funders. So I think what I'm saying is, yeah, your plan has to be reflective of the situation on the ground. Um, that's, that's, that's the way it is. What, it, what are the existing conditions? What caused it? You know, you know kind of typical SWOT analysis. <clears throat> and what does the region want to do moving forward? How are they going to address that? With the, <clears throat> with the understanding that I feel um, probably multiple funders it will take multiple funders. So particularly with housing, it, it could be HUD, it could be, it could be in any number of federal agencies. And, you know, we do have an economic development integrator uh, team too, so that when we start to look at things very broadly, <clears throat> if the EDA isn't really in that space in terms of funding, we could also kind of bring other agencies to the table to see where is the best, what is the best venue for you. Um, one of the ways to do that as part of your planning process is to have someone identify that for you as well. Um, a funding plan, you know, include funding as part of your planning process as well and have someone research what the opportunities are. I know when we did the, the broadband workshop, for example, we did one that uh, we spoke exclusively to federal funding opportunities, what we fund and what we don't. Uh, we had multiple federal agencies on that technical assistance webinar. And we also talked uh, through uh, e even philanthropical institutions to the extent that we're able to help you with that too. And we know of them, we, we can identify those for you as well. So it's really not a one size fits all. And, and we all exist, all of our agencies exist for a specific, uh, specific purpose. And EDA or any federal funder really stays out of the way of the other agencies because we really don't want to duplicate funding efforts in those spaces. And that's, and that's why we kind of take that position when we do what we do well. Are there any more questions there? All right, so moving on to the travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation, as I mentioned, I am working with the Arizona Office of Tourism to do outreach on that sometime in, in September, um, but this is the way it breaks down. Again, we see on the left state grants that went, went to each individual state 
at, at, was set aside at 510 million, 240 million remains. And uh, I feel for tourism in 57.7 million has come to the Seattle Regional Office for that. And EDA prefers projects that directly support travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation. When we say we will consider diversification projects, what we really mean by that is, you know, we do have some communities that were so wholly dependent on tourism. And I mean that nationwide, of course, that part of what they're trying to do is diversify so they are not wholly dependent on tourism. And so they may be looking at other avenues. And when we say we will consider those diversification projects, that tends to be what we're talking about. I think the important distinction I'd like to make here is, is with regard to marketing. And so we've given the discretion at, to the state to do all of the destination marketing. Um, they can't do those economic diversification projects that I just mentioned, but for the competitive portion, we cannot fund lo local destination marketing. So when you think about it, whether it's a strategic plan, um, whether it's destination development, some type, you know, again, construction and non-construction projects, but exclusive of marketing. Are there any questions with those, with this? Okay, so we can, we can move on to the next one then. So indigenous communities, uh, the Seattle Regional Office has received 43, about $43.8 million out of this 100 million. And we really wanna work hand in hand with Arizona's Indian tribes, who we, who we know are really disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Uh, and indigenous communities, the one thing I would like to point out is that they are also eligible to apply under uh, uh, all of EDA's notice of funding opportunities, but we have set aside this $100 million pot exclusively for tribes because we know that they have been disproportionately affected and we're looking um, at infrastructure uh, development in Indian country is more foundational in nature. Um, and again, a wide range of technical planning, workforce development, entrepreneurship and public works and infrastructure projects are eligible under this program. Uh, tribes are eligible for 100% federal share, which means there is no matching requirement for an Indian tribe. And I am working with the Intertribal Council of Arizona to do some outreach specific to Arizona's Indian tribes as well. And of course, welcome the opportunity to engage with uh, tribal members by simply reaching out to Colony. And I and we've had we've been having some good conversations about this one in particular. So moving on to the economic adjustment assistance notice of funding opportunity, this, this pot is $500 million nationally. What that means to the Seattle Regional Office is about $59.4 million. And this is the notice of funding opportunity that I mentioned, you can see at the bottom of the screen, $200 million of this has been set aside for coal communities and that's national. So we're not really comparing apples to apples here. We've got 59.4 in Seattle and 200 nationally. So there's some subset there, um, but there is no specific allocation for coal communities funding to Seattle either. So I, I just wanna make that clear. This is by far our most flexible NOFA. And so if you find that the project you're working on doesn't fit tightly under any of the others, this would be the, the, the one that you'd probably be looking at. And this is what you know typically uh, it reflects our more traditional portfolio in the way that we've worked, at, we've worked in the past. And we'll see here typically individual projects where you'll see things like the Good Jobs Challenge and Build Back Better. We're really looking at creating an infrastructure, uh, a, a region. Uh, we're taking a regional approach to things uh, with this, like a series of projects, but this one we're, we're still looking at the individual project here. Again, construction and non-construction. Um, and, but our, our out, we're looking for the same outcomes, long-term, regionally oriented, coordinated, collaborative economic development, and again, with an emphasis on resilience, um, because we are looking to build stronger regional economic links. And we, we realize that those individual projects really do contribute to, toward that effort. And, and in this under this NOFO, we're looking at those individual projects in that way. Nexus of jobs. Yeah, well, you know, that is the focus of the Economic Development Administration. So every project 
I think a couple of things. Every project has to be linked to an overarching economic development strategy of some kind, whether it's the SEDS or whether it's a SEDS equivalent. And the intent of these economic development strategies would be to uh, attract business development, recruit, retain businesses, uh, create entrepreneurship opportunities, and also to create good paying um, living wage jobs with that, you know, have the opportunity for growth. And I think in some cases that also means upskilling or retraining folks. You know, we, we understand that not only are there communities that suffer from chronic unemployment, but a lot of folks have just simply lost their jobs during the pandemic. And they may be jobs that they're not going back to. So it's really about how we're all pivoting to at this juncture. Um, some of us are not, some of us are. And in order for us to pivot though, we also kind of need to, to be retrained. So that's kind of all part of the work, the workforce development component. And that link between the opportunity directly with an employer is something that we're looking at. So say for example, um, you know, or you have some sense what types of industry is looking to move into Arizona, or even a specific employer is it wants to move into the state of Arizona. What we would be looking for is some type of project that makes that link to that employer or that industry type, to the type of skill that's required for someone to get a job in, the, in that industry, one that's really good paying. And then you can approach it from a number of different, different angles. What, where are the gaps, right? Because in the end of the day, here we've are, we're identifying the strengths, now where are the gaps and we wanna fill those gaps. That could be in workforce training, that could be in infrastructure development. Um, that could be in planning. I mean, we see them. We, we fund incubator spaces, for example. We fund accelerators. We fund, um, I mean, what's another? I mean, so, some of them are construction projects, and some of, some of that is programmatic development. But what we want to see at the end of the day in your application, um, that, there's a, that you've made the link to that, that you understand the link, that you understand by filling that gap, that there's a demonstrated need and a demonstrated opportunity. And the way we measure that, I mean, we have metrics. The way we measure that is how many jobs do you think will be created as a result of this project? With it, not, not with a plan so much because the plan isn't gonna be the job generator, but the outcomes from that planning process as you deliver on that plan is gonna be the job generator. Um, whether it's a bird in the hand, so to speak, you have that employer, you've got that employer commitment and they said, if we have X number of folks trained in this particular skill and we move into this area, we could anticipate creating X number of jobs. Sometimes that means, but for broadband connectivity, this employer would move in. So maybe a requirement is, hey, we've got this big opportunity with this employer, but this area isn't served well by broadband. So that's the demonstrated need. And, and the demonstrated outcome is this employer moving in that has the ability to create X number of jobs or <clears throat> entrepreneurial opportunities. And it has to be quantified in some way. Again, bird in the hand is, is probably the best case scenario, but we've also had um, projections, for example, predictive modeling, but the predictive modeling too is also based on a sound strategy. Um, so it's not thinking that we're gonna, in, we're gonna invest in infrastructure and once we have that set up, we'll find out what businesses will want to come here. It's, it's a little bit more interactive and it's, and it's much more strategic than that. And we would, we, would look to, we would look for that strategy, so to speak. Easy to move the overall rubric of job creation as we drill down into this. We're talking planning and uh, uh, technical assistance and these things, but this is all under the umbrella of jobs. And, yes, uh, I, I, I find myself forgetting that um, we do have a question related to this. It, does this require a COVID nexus or is there an assumption of the impacts? So in other words, does a community have to just demonstrate how they were so negatively impacted by COVID or is that simply assumed? Well, what you'll look what you look to see in every single notice of funding opportunity is uh, an element of resilience. So whether it's COVID or whether it's COVID type situation where there's a sudden economic shutdown, that includes COVID for sure. Um, we are looking to see how your project or series of projects 
demonstrates resilience. And in every single notice of funding opportunity, you will see a page dedicated to uh, the, I, the title of it is here's what EDA, here's how EDA defines resilience. Here's what it means. Here's what resilience means to the EDA. Now, in order for you to demonstrate your project is resilient, um, I think part of that is, you know, we have to show, we're always showing about, here's what happened to us. This thing happened, here's how it affected us. So this is kind of like your baseline, baseline information, right? Here's where we were two years ago. Here's what happened with a sudden economic shutdown. Here's what we've learned and here's how we're moving forward. And now here's how we're I feel a, a lot of folks, I mean, I, we all adapted because we're all here, right? Yeah. So and we all now we all know how we did that. Some of it, I think, was intuitive. Uh, some of it was like learning on the fly. But I feel at this point in time, we kind of all know what happened to us. And we're starting to have a better understanding of what's going to work for us moving forward. I think we would identify that now as resilience. And so now what we want to make sure of, we want to make sure that that is now baked in to your planning process, because I think the other thing that we've learned is the pandemic is, is, isn't really a one shot deal at this point. I mean, we're moving through it in stages. Um, and then there's other things, you know, for example, climate change. We talk about climate change a lot. We've seen what's happening in Arizona. We've seen what's happening over the summer. We understand too that, you know, Arizona has been in a severe drought for the last 20 years. We know that the fires are exacerbating that, whether it's in Arizona or globally, right? I mean, people in New York, are feeling the effects of the fires on the West Coast. So, and we also understand that that's not going away anytime soon either. So I think our point is here that it is COVID, but we also recognize it's a host of other things as well. And you simply need to identify for us, what is, what is it um, that you're building resilience toward? What is impacting your community or what has, and how are you building in resilience with this project? And we will be looking for that in every single in every single case. It doesn't necessarily have to be COVID. It could be flood related, no. fire related, no. uh, drought related, etc. Okay. Drought related, absolutely drought related as well. Very good. Um, there's a question in here go, taking us back to the tribal conversation um, from Brian Cole. If the project fully benefits tribal interests only but the applicant is a non-tribal nonprofit, does a 100% investment rate, i.e. no match, still apply? So the only eligible applicant under the indigenous communities NOFO, for example, is a federally recognized Indian tribe. And that means that the tribe is the applicant. Okay. That said, tribes have you know other corporations associated with them. A nonprofit of any kind, unless it's a, a, a an arm of the tribal government itself. If it's a nonprofit of any kind, it is subject to the matching requirement. Gotcha. Okay. So and the nonprofit could have a letter of support, for example, from the Indian tribe, um, if that if it's if they're working on a tribal project, but the nonprofit itself would come in at the <clears throat> matching requirement 8020. An evaluation form for the grant applications that you can share with us as a tool to frame our application. Okay, <clears throat> that's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in every NOFO, and they're all and they're all a little bit different. Uh, toward the end of the NOFO, you will see evaluation criteria. There, are, I think there are nine elements for which your application would be reviewed, and I think that's very important. Um, I don't know if it's Julia that's asking that question. Yeah. <clears throat> That is so important to look at. So besides, you know, are you meeting the envision, are you meeting the mission of the organization? Are you focusing on one or more of the investment strategies? What is your project? Are you, have you built in resilience, right? What you really need to look at too, how do you speak to those things? And how you speak to those things, it's important to look at how the EDA is going to evaluate that. <clears throat> and those are identified in each, each and every NOFO. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. And if anybody wants to talk through that at some other point in time, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to spend more time on that as well. Sylvia um, from Dallas has a question about border closures with Mexico. Uh, would, would that constitute uh, uh, a need? Is just like fires or drought or COVID? I, I think that if border closures 
are <clears throat> are something that you can plan for or you see as routine. I, I I would I would I would wonder if they're specifically related to some of the other things we talked about. No. Is it because of a pandemic? Is it because of some sudden economic shutdown? Yeah. I, I would think you'd have to, I think, to look at that. Because of COVID, right? It's, it, it's not a, a a regular occurrence, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good questions. Okay. Are we ready to go to the next slide? Yes. I, well, yeah. From my perspective. Gosh, Keith, we're we're running we're running at time. Um, uh, I don't know if we can. Uh, I'm I'm free, but I I know that I'm free um, too. So if folks have to jump. Okay. Off, uh, okay, okay. So the good jobs challenge, $500 million, again, national challenge. Um, what we're really looking to do and the difference between that individual project model that we saw in the EAA is we're really looking to build and strengthen systems. And this system, of course, is the job system to address, to address the challenges that American workers have faced and we want to face them head on. And so the way we're really, we're really wanting to do that is through collaborative training efforts. And here especially is where we're going to focus on women, people of color and historically underserved communities because we do recognize that a resilient economy addresses everybody uh, that, that's part of the community. So what we're really doing here is we're encouraging community organizations to partner with employers to create talent pipelines that meet industry needs and also create sustainable wages. And I think the important emphasis here is on regional systems. It's a, it's a jobs system, uh, an entire workforce pipeline. I think what that looks like would be really up to the applicant and really to the communities to address the needs. And I feel that they know what they are. What I like about this one in particular is they under is an, a keen understanding of the obstacles that hold folks back. And it's not just about training and skills, but it's also the wraparound services. Uh, you know, it's childcare, for example, it's transportation. And so all of these things, we, 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 wanna, we wanna build the entire infrastructure, so to speak. And so really that's, that's what this job challenge is about. We don't fund construction. I think that's the one takeaway here. And, and what I mean by that, we spend a little bit more time on here. So what does that mean? We don't fund construction. So really, what do we fund? So when we look at capital expenses that we may typically put in, on, you know, this uh, equivalent to construction, what we're really talking about in terms of capital expenses, we're talking about purchases of equipment, uh, leases, for example, but not constructing a building. Uh, they are permitted. So that, that is distinctly different than construction activities. Any workforce program that requires construction, we, you know, that's what those other uh, opportunities are about. And that's, that is a really solid project for the EAA that we just discussed. But again, we're looking to build that workforce infrastructure that kind of, what I would say, intangible, not bricks and mortar type facilities that we would typically do under the other NOFO. Um, and disbursement of the funds are, uh, you know, really reimbursable upon each a completion of each successful phase of the workforce development benchmarks that would be identified in your application. All right, so we saved the best, most complicated one for last. So for those of you who have stuck with us for so long, here we, here we go. Um, the Build Back Better Challenge, this is by far the biggest transformational uh, notice of funding opportunity that EDA has out right now and perhaps ever. Uh, and, and this is where the word transformation comes in. We are looking to transform economies and dress, distressed communities through substantial investment. And what we mean by that is beyond individual projects, which we recognize as significant, but we're really looking to build up regional growth clusters, economic development clusters. Um, and so we're looking for regional coalitions and, and it's and it's a very complicated, uh, complex, process. And so you see some of the infographics on the right. This is, again, not something that the EDA is defining for you. But I feel that even intrinsically or intuitively, even with our individual projects over time, we kind of know what we're trying to do. We're trying to wrap ourselves around a particular area that has a particular economy that we'd like to build up. 
And there are lots of us working in those, right? It could be an educational institution. It could be several cities that are working together. Um, broadband comes into this quite a, quite a bit. So we could be looking at a service cluster, a manufacturing cluster, an ag tech cluster. What is the industry? What is the economy? What could the economy be based on? And to form a coalition that wraps itself around that. And, and so we're doing that in two phases. Um, we're looking to develop, you know, I think 50 or 60 clusters in phase one. And only those clusters, only those that have applied for phase one can move to phase two, um, three to eight projects per regional cluster. Here, this is the other opportunity for which we've set aside $100 million for coal communities. So Keith, if you wanna to move to the next slide, um, can talk a little bit more about how this, this phased approach is going to work because the clock is ticking on this one. Um, for phase one, we're looking at 50 to 60 regions nationwide, and this is for technical assistance to help regions prepare for phase two and also to mature those clusters. So while we already do kind of have some sense of what we're coalescing around, this phase one kind of allows you to pursue and, and, and finalize those details. And you get $500,000, the $500,000 technical assistance doesn't have to be completely expended in phase one, but can extend over phase two as you kind of deliver those projects. But in phase two, we're going to be looking for a series of projects that have been identified by the coalition that once these projects are, are fully developed, really kind of you're lifting up the entire region all at once. So it, instead of taking these individual projects time after time, year after year, we're, we're just saying like, let's just do it all at once and, and give the whole thing a big push and, and get it going. And so out of those 50 to 60 regions that were awarded out of phase one, we'll probably be looking at about 20 to 30 regions that move into implementation in phase two. <clears throat> and the reason you kind of see these numbers, you know, go from like 25 million to 75 million up to 100 million per region is really because it's really for, for you to define what it is you need for that region. And maybe it is only three projects. Maybe it is eight projects. Again, it's really up to you. It could be a workforce development project. It could be a broadband project. It could be a training center project. You know, it's hard to say what it would be. And it's really not for us to insert ourselves into what it could be, but to really provide you the latitude to really determine what that means for your region and, and of course, let us know how we could support that and in a very specific way. And that, that again is where the data comes in and how you quantify that. Um, what does a regional economic cluster look like? We've got a lot of information. We've got incredible subject matter experts at EDA who are really experts in this field. Um, if we're not familiar with economic cluster clustering or regional clustering, there's, there's a lot we can do. Uh, but the deadlines are, are, are tough. So the, you know, the NOFO opened up in July. The concept proposal deadline is October 19th. And the application deadline for phase two is March 15th. And the reason those deadlines are, are the way they are is because Congress has really mandated that all funding under the American Rescue Plan has been awarded uh, by September 22. And, and this is the time that we need to meet our statutory requirement, our congressional, our congressional mandate. So I think if you didn't know it already, I, I, I want to stress to you that EDA is, is really thinking big. We are really thinking big and we want to continue to think big. So with the American Rescue Plan programs, we're addressing larger projects than ever before because it really gives us the opportunity to transform communities all across the country. Um, we'll all, we're, and we're also expanding EDA's reach. Um, we want to support communities and we wanna support equitable recovery. And we also wanna help build back better through community-led economic development. And so again, I, I do really wanna reinforce here that we're here to support you. We are not looking to define these things for you. We're not looking to determine an approach for you but we're really looking to, to support you do that. And, and again, as I mentioned, as you kind of think through this stuff and you're thinking of creative means, creative uh, way, means to do this, please reach out to us. And if it, again, if it's something that we haven't heard of before, if it's something we've never tried before, 
we're going to see if we can. Uh, when we look at these economic clusters, for example, we've talked about multi-jurisdictional lines, you know, working across state lines, because economic boundaries don't always follow so cleanly political boundaries. And we're open to that. Um, and even sometimes with regard to Arizona, when we look at those regions, those natural economic clusters could cross into other EDA regions, such as, you know, our Denver office or our Austin regional office. And while it would, you know, increase the complexity of a project like that, I just want to share with you they're open. I mean, we're, we're open. We've even talked about, you know, Arizona, Mexico, for example, probably complex, um, but we're also open to that. So I just, I just want to let folks know that to the extent that we could do that, we are, we're, we're willing to work with you very closely toward that end. And, you know, that's about it for me, Keith. Uh, on, on the next page, I do have my contact information. And I just want to say, you know, here I am in Arizona. And so I'm here for you. I'd love to hear from you. Always accessible. If we want to do more sessions like this, if we want to do a deeper dive into any one of these six, I'm just always happy to do that. And I'm just really looking forward to hearing from folks um, as we move Thank forward you. through this. Thank you. We, we do have one more question here from uh, James Shank. Can a cluster be only rural communities or does it have to have a metropolitan area? Okay, well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to have anything. It doesn't have to look like anything specifically. But I do know that, you know, the opportunity to link urban and rural together, uh, maybe not even physically, but through workforce or something else, you know, we, we would be looking for that. Um, but it's not exclusive to either urban or rural, nor must it include one of each, for example. So we're open. I, I know this is one of those situations, Keith, you're probably the better expert here. It, it's really kind of, I feel this is more market driven than anything yeah. else. Yeah, and it, it, it's market driven um, in that like workforce dynamics, they don't always uh, stick to jurisdictional boundaries. They, they frequently cross and that's what creates regional economies. And so I, I think it's, it just depends on what the project is or what you're thinking, but I've um, I don't, I, I'm with you. I don't think we need to hem ourselves into um, geographic or municipal boundaries. Um, but Cindy, thank you. What I've, uh, a couple of things, my takeaways today are um, think big. The word transformational is uh, ever present. Uh, resiliency, which to me is, is the 2000, 2021 term for sustainable. Um, so uh, resiliency, equity is, is, is another component that must be ever present in these things. Um, and then um, uh, be realistic. Um, three to five million dollars is a sweet spot for the agency per award is what is what I heard. And, and uh, I think if, if applications are probably within that range, you probably have a, a pretty good shot at being reviewed uh, pretty closely. Um, and, and I might, uh, I'll also remind uh, the audience that um, on the ACA website, if you go under webinars, there is a grant writing uh, tips and tricks webinar that was very valuable that Sarah Wagner did. And it's a great refresher on the do's and don'ts of, of applying for a grant. Um, we have a question, Cindy, of, of this presentation. Is it available on the EDA website? Um, Keith, I think you're recording it. I, I don't know that it'll be on okay. EDA's website, okay. but I think it'll well, be on your website. It will be on our website. Um, uh, I think we can we can make it, uh, we can post both the recording as well as the presentation on the website and, yeah. uh, and make that happen. So folks I can, can do find it, it after the session's over. Okay, thank you, Armando. Um, so again, thank you, Cindy, very much for your time. I hope this was informative for everybody. I found Cindy to be very responsive to any questions I have anytime I, I call or inquire. I'm also very cognizant that Cindy's the messenger. She doesn't make these rules. Uh, and so uh, even though uh, her answer might not be what I want to hear, uh, I, I respect the spot that she's in. So thank you. And uh, we will talk soon. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, everyone.